Hey, what is up guys? Welcome back to chapter 5 of the video series. There it is, you made it. You finally learned all the prerequisite knowledge that you need to know before you can start learning solar cells. We learned about semiconductor physics, PN junction diode, and photons. Now there's nothing left to do and to start learning solar cells. In this chapter 5.0, we are going to learn about the working principle of a solar cell, the solar cell IV curve, some important photovoltaic parameters, and also explore the datasheet of a typical commercial crystalline silicon solar cell. And before I start, I'd like to thank RS Grassroots Education for sponsoring this video. You can also find written versions of my videos under the Design Spark website, links down in the description box. In these articles, I've put down links to further reference materials for your further reading. These materials are the ones that I previously used before while I was learning about solar cells, so rest assured that they are good ones. So now, there's nothing else to do but to sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. Now, we all know that a solar cell is basically just a PN junction diode with light shining on it. When a photon from sunlight that has a higher energy than the band gap of the solar cell strikes an electron from the P side, it is excited from the valence band to the conduction band. We now have a hole in the valence band. This hole freely wanders around the valence band because it's a majority carrier, waiting for an electron to recombine with it. If the excited electron manages to reach the depletion region, it will be swept out by the electric field in the depletion region, and the electron ends up at the end side. As a majority carrier, the electron diffuses to the anode. This electron travels through the external circuit, through the output device that we want to power, and back to the P side. Then, it recombines with the hole that was left in the valence band earlier. This cycle repeats itself, and we now have current flow from the N side to the P side of the PN junction. We call that light generated current, which is opposite to the flow direction of a PN junction under forward bias. Let us watch this sequence a few more times to really grasp the concept of current flow in PN junction solar cells. However, because of this flow of electrons, a voltage drop will be developed at the resistor. A positive anode develops on the left side of the load, while a negative cathode develops on the right. This voltage drop effectively forward biases the solar cell like how it does in a normal PN junction. This creates a current which we call duct current flowing from the P side to the N side due to the diffusion of electrons like in the normal PN junction. But in order for a solar cell to do work for us, the light generated current will be much higher than the dark current. The two opposing light generated current and dark current result in a net current flowing from the N side to the P side. This net current is the current that you will measure flowing through the wire and load. The voltage will simply be the forward bias voltage that is developed across the load. So how can we best represent these parameters so that in one look we can know all of the characteristics of the solar cell? In the solar cell world, it is very common to represent all the solar cell parameters via a current voltage curve or an IV curve. We remember from chapter 3 that in a PN junction, the dark current looks something like this. The light generated current is in the opposite direction of the dark current, so it is negative and constant. Now, the net current will then be the sum of these two graphs, which is a curve like this. Now, this may make you feel hungry. But almost all solar cell curves look like a quarter piece of pizza. Well, sort of. 
What this graph tells us is that the current at different voltages and vice versa. When the voltage is zero, we will have the maximum current. This is called the short circuit current. When the current is zero, we will have the maximum voltage. This is called the open circuit voltage. In most solar cell IV curves, the curve is inverted around, which means we take the direction of light generated current as the positive direction. In a solar cell, we are very interested in the power that it produces. The higher the power, the more efficient the solar cell is. We know that power equals the voltage multiplied by current. This means that at open circuit and short circuit conditions, the power is zero. If we go along this curve, we find that there is a point right about here where a certain combination of voltage and current produces the maximum power. This is then the ideal operating point of the solar cell. Well, of course, if the solar cell can operate at short circuit current and open circuit voltage simultaneously, it will generate the highest power. However, this is not possible simply because this point is not in the graph. The fraction of the maximum operating power to the power from the short circuit current multiplied by open circuit voltage is called the fill factor. From the maximum power of the solar cell, we can then determine the efficiency of the solar cell, where the solar cell efficiency is the maximum power divided by the power of sunlight shining on the solar cell. All these four parameters, short circuit current, open circuit voltage, fill factor, and power conversion efficiency, are standards to define the characteristics of a solar cell and tells us how well a solar cell is performing. If you do power lifting, it's kind of like the weight of your best bench press, squat and deadlift. You get what I mean. These parameters are presented in almost all research papers in solar cells. Let us take a look at the research paper produced reporting the current record-breaking efficiency crystalline silicon solar cell. This is the IV curve for a current record-breaking efficiency crystalline silicon solar cell. It has a short circuit current of 169.9 milliamps, open circuit voltage of 726.6 millivolts, and a fuel factor of 84.28%. The maximum power is 104.1 milliwatts and this corresponds to a power conversion efficiency of 26.1%. Remember, this experiment is performed for a very small solar cell area of 3.986 cm square. As the solar cell gets larger, like the commercial ones that we see today, the efficiency drops because more defects will appear and it causes recombination. Typical commercial crystalline silicon solar cell has an efficiency of about 20%. Now, let us explore a typical commercial crystalline silicon solar cell and analyze its data sheet. This is a solar module from Canadian Solar. Now, the first thing that we usually want to ask is what type of solar cell is this? So if we scroll to the bottom, we can find that this is a monocrystalline solar cell. So it has to be a bit more efficient than the polycrystalline ones. This is a solar cell with an efficiency of 19.5% for its base model. In the solar cell data sheet, we designers usually are most interested in the maximum power that it can deliver, which is 435 watts. Now, remember, this maximum power can only be delivered when its operating voltage is at 40.5 volts and its current is at 10.75 amperes. This corresponds to the maximum voltage and current that produces the maximum power. So only with this combination of voltage and current, we can produce this power. So this is something to take note of uh, when designing your system. Now, 
The IV curve of the solar cell is presented here. You can see there are a few different types of curves. This corresponds to different sunlight intensities and different temperatures. So depending on your condition, your environment, which country um, you're in, you will have different types of sunlight intensities and different temperatures. And you need to search for the curve that matches your environment. So this will provide a different efficiency. That's it guys for chapter 5.0. In this chapter, we learned about the working principle of a solar cell, the solar cell IV curve, some important photovoltaic parameters, and also explore the data sheet of a typical commercial crystalline silicon solar cell. In the next chapter, we are going to learn the typical solar cell structure and also introduce a very interesting theoretical efficiency limit of a solar cell. Coming up next, take care and goodbye.